Welcome back to the show. Now, this is a big, big weekend. It's uh, one of the great sporting weekends of the year. There's racing at the Curragh, but more importantly, on Sunday in Croke Park, Cork and Kilkenny meet in the All-Ireland Hurling uh, final, and it's going to be a great match. There's never been a match so eagerly awaited for a very, very long time, and I have an interest as a Kilkenny man, and uh, Ben there has an interest. He's a Cork man, and his wife is from Kilkenny. Uh, ben, who will you be shouting for? Both sides. Both sides. That's a wise option. Well, it's a great, and we have two. <laughs> we have two wonderful people uh, to join us now. Uh, first of all, the man who led the revival of Clare hurling. Uh, they won in 1995. They won again in 1997. And the man who led a revival of Wexford hurling, and in the year in between, in 1996, Wexford won the McCarthy Cup. Will you please welcome? From Clare, the great Gerald Lachnan, and Liam Griffin from Wexford. Good is up. Good over there. How are you? How are you? How's it going, Brian? How are you? How are you? How are you? How are you? Liam, sit down there. I'm grand. Ben. Now, gentlemen, uh, you're both very welcome to the programme. It's a privilege to have you on our programme at any time, and particularly on the eve of this great match. But there's a shadow looming over this occasion, Liam, and I know that at your request, uh, you want to say something about the scurrilous hounding of the great man, DJ Carey, and his family. Yeah, well, from, from all of us who were involved in the game of hurling, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a massive disappointment that and uh, opportunistic to pick this particular weekend, uh, the, the great weekend of his life and the great weekend of Kilkenny people's life and all hurting people. And uh, I know they've, uh, they've hounded him from out of here. And uh, mm. I think there's two children involved here as well. There's a family, all of us have families, all of us have our difficulties, every one of us have our difficulties. And, and I think that anything that would be said or done to, uh, you know, to upset those children as well and to upset the whole scene is... Uh, tabloid press gone mad and uh, I, I think it's, it's a part of Ireland which I certainly find repulsive yes. and uh, I'm sorry um, for DJ and his wife and his family and all of the people in Kilkenny and let's hope that it, uh, it doesn't cast a major shadow and let's hope, and I know Cork people as well, Cork hurling people yes. will all wish DJ well but all Irish hurling people will wish DJ well and his wife and his children mm -hmm. and it's regrettable, terrible and it's a sad day for Ireland really. Chair, I know... Uh, And I hope the boys out there who have their pictures and their story primed, there's still time to back away from it. Chair, I know this was you and Liam requested that you wanted to, to speak about this. I yeah. haven't prompted you. Chair. Because I think uh, Liam and myself knew that this, this story was coming uh, uh, be, because it had been well uh, documented over the last week or so. And, uh, you know, in amateur sport, I, mean, I think it's different from professional sport. Yes. In amateur sport, your personal life, your business life are totally different to your sporting life. You know, we have to establish those parameters. And uh, DJ, who we all admire, we're only interested in DJ's life on the field. The magical moments he has given us over the last 10, 12, 14 years, whatever length he has been with Kilkenny, that's all we're interested in. We're not interested in anything else. We're interested in how he plays the next Sunday, how he has played in the past, the great thrills he has given us, the brilliant scores he has got for Kilkenny. Mm. And we are from Wexford, we are from Clare, we're from, we, we've, imposed, we've opposed DJ at many, uh, at many times. We've devised plans in <laughs> order to stop DJ at many, <laughs> many <laughs> times. You know, <laughs> and we've done all kinds of things to stop him. But I'll tell you, we look on this as absolutely the bottom of the barrel. You know? And I, I just recall one thing from last week that a person said, uh, one of the reporters involved in this so-called story on Sunday said, he, he was challenged and he was told that this was scum. And he said, S is for scum and S is for sales. Yes. Now, that is the bottom line as regards this newspaper is concerned. Yes, and we all know the newspaper concerned. And I'll tell you, boys, the Irish people won't forgive you if he disgraces on this great day. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. The, the all-on of finally sacrosanct. And, and added, added to that, him, 
I, I tell you, Eddie, today, you know, just, just a little sideline to that is, I was faced in 1998, we were faced with a huge situation as regards belittling the All-Ireland final. You know, there was a replay against Offaly, very controversial about the referee and all of that. And my one fundamental principle was, you know, whether Clare would play against Offaly in the third replay, I said, the All-Ireland final has been there for hundred, over 100 years. It is sacrosanct. Nobody besmirches the All-Ireland final. That's right. That is the whole bottom line. Yeah. It is there for 100 and whatever it is, 117 years, whatever it is now. Nobody besmirches that. And I hope that that editor, that paper, whatever it is that wants to bring out this story on Sunday, rethinks and rethinks the consequences of bringing out that story. Leave it aside. This, we are all looking forward to a massive contest between Cork and Kilkenny on Sunday. We want no sidelines. We want no distractions from that. We want to see a fantastic game between Kilkenny and between Cork. We don't want any distractions no. from that. That we, is enough. We don't and want And that's it. the bottom line. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> to me, it's easier. <laughs> Now, Liam, yeah. if this great sport of hurling, which is our national game, were to go into decline in the face of the onslaught of the Premiership and other things, what would Ireland lose? Well, I, I don't want to get too, too carried away because the last time I, I spoke on television, I talked about the passion and so forth, and John Boland quite correctly said, all about this passion, you get the same in sex and in the Sopranos. So uh, <laughs> when you get carried away to speak about hurling, and I get carried away, quite frankly. But I really, I really think that um, it's part of what we are. It, it genuinely is. And, and people have written about hurling uh, a lot more eloquently than I have written. Well, you've spoken very eloquently. And one of the things you've said, it's not the same playing soccer as playing hurling. Tell me why. Well, I, and I, I have to preface this, soccer is a good game, don't get me wrong. It's not the same. I mean, for us, it's part of our, of our, of our culture. It's part of who we are as, as people. And it's, it's so far back in our tradition. I mean, if you go back through these generations, I could trace hurling for you right back as far as Coo Cullen and the landlords and hurling and uh, all of the, over the centuries. But if you want to find a, a, a nerthy kind of relationship with a game that's part of everything that you stand for, that's part of the parish that you're born in, you cut the ash plant out of the, out of the ditch. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very earthy, uniquely Irish game. I didn't know that until I read the research that Sally did on mm -hmm. this, that you actually cut the ash plant out of the ditch, and it's shaped in the shape of It's shaped already, because you, when, you, when you curve it, where the, where the ash plant curves, that's where the hurlies are made from. But the interesting thing about it is that from, from a skill point of view, there's absolutely no question in my mind. You could take soccer, you could take any other game. There's no question that the skill level in hurling is absolutely unique. And also that the people who play the game at the highest level, we don't have, everybody is not a wonderful hurler, but the people who play it at the, at the highest level are incredible skill sportsmen and they are amongst the best in the world. And the reason they are is got to, to, to master yes. a flying orb at 100 miles an hour with an ash plant that is three foot long and they've got to twist and turn They've got to sell dummies, they've got to go sideways, backwards, jump in the air, and above all, they've got to be warriors. Yes. There is no hiding place for a real hurling man. If you want to be there, if the blood wants to flow in your veins and you want to be part of a major game, you have to be a warrior. And then, you match that to your Irishness, and it's uniquely part of us. Now, it's, it's absolutely essential for Ireland that hurling grows, not just stays as no. it is, that it grows. And because you preach that hurling is such a great game, there tends to be a bias against you for saying that, as if you were some kind of a half-demented, you know, shillelagh wheel and dub yeah. yeah. But in fairness... There were a few of them around in the past. <laughs> there were a few of them in the past. Yes, there was a few in the past, and I had no time for them, by the way, as well, because we all have our abusers in every sport, by the right. way. That's, that has to be said. But it's, it's unique to us. It's a wonderful spectacle. It's something to be very proud of, and it's something we should cherish and develop, and that's our responsibility in the GA. Chair, winning the All-Ireland for Clare after 83 years. I cried when I, when I watched Anthony Daly's wonderful speech. Uh, and it, what did it mean to the people of Clare? Oh, like, I, I, I didn't cry myself, Eamon, but... <laughs> you can't cry, you're not able to cry. <laughs> it's because I was probably so psyched up for the game itself, but... Uh, what did it mean? 
It, meant, uh, it meant, I suppose, more about... Every town, all, land and village. Yeah, an increase in their self-esteem. You know, and there's so much emphasis nowadays on self-esteem. You have all these courses, you know, on building up your own self-esteem. But for years and years, we had been beaten down by Tip and Cork and Limerick and all the other teams. And, you know, uh, I played for Clare for 16 years at Intercounty Hurling. And I saw that... You know, every year something happened. Ill look, as it, as it was described by then. Ill look, something came in our way of winning even a monster championship, Eamon, not to talk of an All-Ireland. And here we got a gang of young lads who were ambitious, you know. I, I, I think it was a reflection, Eamon, of the new Ireland as yes. well, you know. The new, educated, intelligent yes. guys yes. who weren't going to settle for second best, who were, who, whose ambition was, you know, I remember Brian Lohan saying, he, he said to me, I could never contemplate, he said, now winning in All-Ireland. Now, I never heard a Clare player that I played with, yes. or that had gone before me, saying, making this kind of statement. And that was, you know, it, 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 it reflected the changing Ireland at the time. Yes. They were ambitious. Mm -hmm. They wanted to win, and they were going to win. And all they wanted was the leadership that would lead them on on the right path to win that All Ireland. Now, I'm not saying I gave that. It was a long process. A man who came before me, Lynn Gaynor from Tipperary, he laid the foundations for it. I, we, we, all of us that took it over from them, we just carried it on. But when we won, you wouldn't believe the change it brought around and clear people. You know, it's not just pride and passion. It was, I suppose, something that will live with them for the rest of their lives. You know, it's, it's now eight years since they won the first All Ireland, and they yeah. all still strike back yeah. to 95. They remember the summer of 95. Yeah. It was brilliant weather, yeah. you know. They remember the games. They remember everything about it. They remember the passion of traveling to the Munster final, the semi-final, the All Ireland. They remember when the game was over. You know, I suppose that is what the GAA is all about. It brings that dimension uh, that no other sport or no other game can bring into the rural communities of Ireland. And it gives people who make that breakthrough a sense of, of self-esteem that no other game can bring them. And that's the brilliance of the GAA. Ben, I can understand every word of Jared's thing, because my roots and background are in Kilkenny, and I spent a lot of time there with my father in Croke Park. But a lot of people, Dubs especially, wouldn't know anything or feel anything about hurling. Isn't that true? Yeah, I just want to make one point, uh, Eamon. I think TJ Carey will prove himself on the pitch. He's a mighty man. He's got unbelievable talent. And he'll rise bigger than what this trash comes out in the paper. And his wife and children will as well. Yeah. So that's the only point I want to make first of all. When, when Liam and Jer talk about the blood stirring, I feel when I go to Croke Park to watch a hurling match, well, do you get that? No, because I haven't got the passion that he, these two men have. And I have passion in different forms of business yes. or in, yeah. but yeah. this is passion. Like the way I was, was passionate to Dunn stores or passionate to the fitness clubs I run now. And that's what brings success, commitment and passion. And if you don't have the passion, that's there's right. nothing there. Liam. That's it. Yeah, um, the, the thing that I feel about, about Ireland, right? Uh, um, over the years, um, I think it's, it's tragedy that so many Irish people don't know anything about hurling. Yes. There are people in this audience tonight, men, who have never held a hurley in their hands in their lives. Mm. There are schools where a hurley has never been seen. Yes. And from, from my point of view, there's an attitude towards hurling sometimes that sees it as a rural stick game played yes. by a lot of rural stick people. Yes. But what I would say, it's like a great opera, it's like a great painting, it's like something magnificent that people would miss themselves. And you don't know unless you've experienced it. Now, Jerry's experienced it, I've experienced it. It's, it's a unique experience. Now, you could say the same about a lot of other sports as well, but the fact that it's unique to our own, to our own culture, it is a tragedy that so many people in Ireland have never played the game. Yeah, I it's think sad. it's in the blood. I mean, I spent 17 years in England and a lifetime in soccer, mm. but I still feel it. I know what you're talking about when yeah, I go to Croke Park. And that's the whole thing, Emma, yeah, you know. Ben, ben is very, it's very true what Ben says here. If there's only one thing in your life that gives you that yeah. kind of, uh, it's nearly a religious kind of thing, you know. Religion doesn't give it any more to the people, no. you know. It's a spiritual, 
mm. kind of a thing that it gives yes, you, it that is. inner feeling that it gives you mm. of satisfaction. It's soul, like soul music. It's a, correct. Well, I don't like, I, I know anything about soul music. <laughs> Let me tell you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever what about soul music. It's, it's, it, it is the soul. It is the soul. It's the soul, of, no our, it's the soul of our country. It is okay. The soul. It is the soul. Now, it is the soul. as a Kilkenny man, I have to get down to brass tacks. And yes. I don't want you to preview the match or anything like that, but Paddy Downey, the great Spar Irish Times sports writer, who's now retired, Fantastic. wrote a most, be man. He wrote a most beautiful man. piece in yeah. the Irish Times I this morning it, yeah. about uh, the clashes down the years between Kilkenny and Cork. And if Oliver Barry's watching, it's uh, 11 to Kilkenny, a very small county, yeah. and 7 to Cork. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, what do you make of Sunday's match? It is a special match, this. It's not just another All-Ireland final. If there could be such a thing, this is really something, isn't it? Yeah, this is a huge game. I mean, for a start, I mean, Jerry's from, from Clare and I'm from Wexford. But we have to recognise, have to recognise that Kilkenny and Cork are the great superpowers of our game. We'd like to be, but we're not. They are, and we have to recognise that. So we've got two superpowers. Carey of Kilkenny, Ring of Cork. The whole magic of the whole game, I think, is absolutely tremendous. But I really think in this game, Kilkenny have come here with a, with this, this time with a different cut about them. I think Kilkenny are hard and strong, a physical team. They've changed. They've, the, the, the game in Kilkenny, Kilkenny has, there's been an evolution in Kilkenny which has made them slightly different in the recent times, and they're a big, strong, hurling team. Cork come, this time, as complete underdogs. I mean, anybody who says they're not underdogs, really, you couldn't say it on known form. So Cork are coming in here as underdogs. Now, that's exactly the kind of way that Cork would like to come into a game, because Cork people have serious attitude. I mean, <laughs> tell us something about that. I, I, I said... Uh, well, are you saying... Uh -huh. But are you saying that Roy Keane has attitude? No, well, absolutely. <laughs> but I, 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 it's just epitomi it just epitomises for me Neil Tobin's line, uh, which he said, uh, he says so well in his great Cork accent that the, the charge of the Light Brigade and into the valley of Death Road of 600, Cork men, every bloody one of them. So they have an attitude, and they have that attitude about hurling. If they didn't, they wouldn't have 28 other titles behind them. Well, you see, you see um, what do Cork people take to? They take the characters. They do. Right, you've mentioned Roy Keane. But in this team, you have Sean Ogo Halpin and Setanto Halpin. You have Joe Dean. You have three real characters that are loved Jodine, and respected yes. by the court public. And the court public have responded to this team, especially after, after the strike last year. I don't recall, you know, court people usually go to matches. They have great wish, great crack, great sportsmanship. And if you beat them, great and all. But there's a new kind of air about the, the supporters this year. They're really, really behind this team. And that gives them an edge that few Cork, people, that few Cork teams have, uh, have had. And that's the edge that will really, really drive them on in Sunday. For the first time this week, I'm getting worried. Are you yeah. saying that a lot yeah. that's possible here? I, I, I do think, uh, I, you know, I, I, I put my cast on the table straight away. And, and I do think that Kilkenny, slightly, would still be favourites. But I would say, as time goes on, and as the days go, go on, I still fancy this Cork team more and more. Satanto so helping. I, I know from the, I know the girls, the ladies in my school now will kill me over this on next Monday. He is the new David Beckham of the house. <laughs> God, God forgive me, yeah, God forgive me. <laughs> Can you edit this program? Can you young, edit this program? Young, a lot of rubbish. Yeah, I, Eamon, uh, a lot young, of rubbish. middle aged. <laughs> Older, they are mad about Satanta. Especially, especially since they saw him without the helmet. Right. He's the, he is the new sex symbol of the G, and, and, and that's brilliant. We right. need, we need. Sex symbols. Yeah, well, we need players like that. Yes, absolutely. And there's a massive, yeah. there's a massive, uh, massive uh, right. kind of support okay, building up be, behind this car team, and that and that makes it because we need that. Yeah, the right. PR is brilliant. The, the PR for the, for the GA, the more players we have like Satanta, the better it is. Now I'm. It's just so such a pleasure to have the three of you here, and there's a gentleman come to Dublin. And he is a true, true legend of the sport of soccer. His name is Jimmy Greaves. He's here uh, to sign his book at Easton's tomorrow at one o'clock. He's one of the greatest men. Even you yeah. guys will know Absolutely. the great yeah. Jimmy Greaves. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome from London, Mr. Jimmy Greaves. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Sit down there beside those guys. Sit down. Now, Sherlock Nan and Liam Griffin.
Uh, yeah, we've all met in the dressing room. Now, I played, against, I played against Jimmy once uh, in an FA Cup tie, uh, but he won't remember. Jimmy, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Dublin. I know you're, you've got your autobiography out. Yes. You're signing copies at Easton's tomorrow. It's yes. a big sporting weekend in this country. Have you ever seen hurling? Only on the television. I mean, I, you know, being an Englishman, I don't understand it, but then most people don't understand cricket, do they? But, uh, so I, I really haven't got too much of a clue what sort of goes on, except one guy batters the other one yeah. with a big lump of wood. You see, no, the and then the ball hits the back of the net, and that's, that's sort of the end of it, really, isn't it? Do you, mean, under, do you understand the passion? Oh, yes. I mean, the passion, as in any sport, I mean, when, when, uh, when you get people that actually follow a game, uh, they're very passionate about it. That, that's obvious. And uh, you, I can understand what uh, these gentlemen have been talking about. Absolutely. Now, I mean, uh, Liam, in Wexford, in darkest Wexford, do you, do you not remember Jimmy Greaves? I remember Jimmy oh, Greaves no. very well. And I remember he should have been under Slayton in, in, in 66. And I was very disappointed he wasn't. I was, incidentally, I was cheering for England in 66. I don't, I, I, when Ireland are not playing, I would cheer for England. I don't yeah. see why I shouldn't. My brother Aaron's a living there and we have a lot of connection. But Jimmy Greaves was a wonderful player. Uh, I, I wish you'd have been him. manager in 66. <laughs> 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 Uh, we can't now, have these, these things all the time. These are two of the greatest managers in Irish history. <laughs> Gerald Oh yeah. Was Jimmy Greaves ever heard of in Clare? Oh, this is before Sky they, now. It's the very same way, you know. I mean, th that was the, the golden era, really, of England, you know, 66 yeah. and 17 mm. Mexico, you know. I remember yes. Peter Benetti in goals yeah. in Mexico. Yeah. So does but everybody in, in Mexico, and I remember the two goals <laughs> he gave away at the very end of the game. I remember walking down the road in Fetal, in East Clare, which would be the <laughs> farthest place removed from, 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 from soccer. And walking into a house of my neighbours and saying, how are you going to get on? And, and all you men say was, Benetti's after giving away two goals. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't that tell you about... That, that, that really was a really golden age for, for, England, for England soccer. And we asked Jimmy, when we met him outside, you know, we said... Yeah, I mean, that's a stupid question to say. Were you disappointed to be dropped from the <laughs> <laughs> Well, he was dropped. Well, of course I was Jimmy, um, the... In your life now, you'd uh, spend a lot of time travelling with George Best. You have a road show. Yes. Uh, which you do together. Yeah, and George and I do. George, yeah. we know, yeah. and you've had the, your uh, alcohol uh, problem, yeah. which you've um, managed, and George now appears not to be managing. What's he like? What's the latest news of him? Well, I, I don't know what the latest news is, Eamon. We, we did a, a show uh, a couple of months ago at the Fairfield Halls at Croydon, which you would know. Yes, I do. And... Um, he was in great form. I mean, we, uh, it was a capacity audience, and uh, and the show went really well. And and he looked fit and well and relaxed. And and I thought, well, I mean, even his manager was smiling. And <laughs> and yeah. and I thought he's cracked it. I really did actually mm. think that this time he'd uh, he'd come through it. And then he had this uh, latest blip. And let's just hope that it is a blip. And uh, that we can get back on the road. We've got about four shows to do before Christmas, and then we've got about 24 next year. So, you know, I mean, I've worked with George under every circumstance. Uh, 